name is Daniel Crane. I'm a law professor at the University of Michigan, and this will be my brief remarks on the topic of ecosystem competition. So as a backdrop, let's think about what is competition to competition law. As a general matter, in both the United States and the European Union, and indeed in most competition law regimes, we think about competition from the perspective of substitutability from the perspective of the consumer. And I've included the slide here, definitions of relevant market uh, analysis in both the U European Union and the United States, where interchangeability or substitution, substitutability uh, is the key concept. Products or services are deemed substitutable uh, and therefore competitive. If they're not substitutable, then they are only potentially complements and they're not competitive products. Now, I wanna suggest that there are other forms of competition that could be of interest to competition law. And some of these are already understood or known. There is a literature on vertical competition over rents in the distribution chain. As a general matter, competition law does not concern itself with vertical com uh, competition. Uh, there's also input competition, which is to say a competition for the same inputs, such as raw materials, real estate, government subsidies, uh, which do not necessarily have to happen among firms that sell substitutionary products. Again, that kind of input competition is not typically of great uh, relevance to the antitrust laws. Uh, but I want to flag a, a third kind of non-substitutionary uh, competition, which is ecosystem competition. And by that, I mean that firms in the same ecosystem compete with rival firms, not necessarily to sell substitute products or services, but to control the value nodes and to commoditize rival nodes or inputs in the same ecosystem. And to flesh this out, I'll give three examples, uh, operating systems, eBooks, and connected and automated vehicles. So the operating systems example comes from the Microsoft case of the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, it's a familiar story. Uh, Microsoft sought to uh, uh, control um, middleware uh, applications like the Java programming language, ostensibly to prevent it from uh, diminishing Microsoft's monopoly in the operating system by commoditizing the operating system and uh, making customers indifferent as to whether they ran programs on Microsoft Windows or on some other uh, operating system. There was a doctrinal puzzle in the Microsoft case, which was, well, if middleware competed with Microsoft's operating system, then shouldn't it have been included in the relevant market, at which point Microsoft uh, might not have had a monopoly anymore. And the answer from the DC Circuit's uh, uh, decision was that, well, although Microsoft viewed Java and other programming languages and middleware as a competitive threat, these were potential competitors only and therefore not presently in the market. Now, I'm gonna suggest that's actually an unpersuasive framing because middleware was not really ever positioned to replace the operating system, but rather to commoditize it. In other words, it was not ever likely that people would uh, start running programs directly from a programming language like Java. Instead, the point was that Java, if it developed enough, could make programmers and customers indifferent on which operating system ran the programs they, they developed or that they used. In other words, the competition between Microsoft and middleware suppliers was not to be substitute products or services, but rather to define value propositions in the um, API and operating system uh, ecosystem. A second example involves um, eBooks and the immense competition that's occurred in the last 10 years or so between uh, Apple and Amazon in particular. Now, if you think traditionally about those two companies, they are not horizontal competitors at all. Apple was a hardware company initially and then developed into software, and Amazon is a retailer. That's its business. It, it grew up selling books online and then uh, uh, sprouted out into other forms of retail distribution. But around 2010, Apple and Amazon became locked in a fierce battle over ebook pricing uh, and control of the ebook ecosystem. Now, it is true that Apple and Amazon at some point um, uh, sort of morphed into selling competitive products. So Amazon did create hardware called the Kindle, the, the e-reader, uh, uh, but it always sold that, that the, the Kindle at a loss, right? It never actually looked to make money uh, or to monopolize, if you will, the, 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 the reader market. Uh, instead, what Amazon's strategy was, was to commoditize the hardware 
and maintain the value proposition in the retail platform. That's what it wanted to, 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 to ensure about this, this ecosystem. On the other hand, while Apple did launch a, an e-book store, its, its, its strategy was not so much to make money off of the e-book store, but instead to commoditize where you bought your book from and instead shift the value proposition into the hardware, into the iPad and into Apple's uh, nodes in the ecosystem. Now, of course, one could analyze the Apple Amazon ebook battles in sort of traditional horizontal competition terms uh, by thinking about, for example, the Kindle versus the iPad or Amazon.com versus the Apple bookstore. But that really would misunderstand the true competitive dynamics, which did not at all depend upon these companies selling substitute products, instead on them fighting to define what was the value proposition and what was the commodity proposition in this wider ecosystem in which they both operated. And then the final example I want to give uh, concerns an emerging technology. Uh, and we don't really know where this will go, but uh, we already see this pattern uh, forming here, which is connected and automated vehicles. So who are the competitors in the world of, of, of connected and automated vehicles? Uh, certainly we can think about car manufacturers to car manufacturers. So Ford and Daimler, for example, uh, or General Motors or Honda or Tesla or anyone else as competitors of one another. And then we have these ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft. Uh, we have automated technology companies like, like Waymo, Google's uh, automated vehicle division. And there are network providers like Qualcomm. And, the, the, and to understand competition in this emerging ecosystem, only through the lens of who sells substitute products and services to consumers is to miss the fact that these companies are all in some sense striving with each other to define where the value propositions will be and what will become more commoditized. For example, will the vehicle itself become a commodity? So it's uh, customers are rel relatively indifferent as to what car you ride in, but the, all the value is in, um, is in the technology or in the network or in the service uh, or in some other node of that ecosystem. And you already see these companies shifting their own business strategies to grow more into each other's spaces without necessarily becoming direct competitors. So Ford and Daimler and General Motors have all announced they're uh, launching some kind of ride sharing service. Uh, will that make them direct competitors with Uber and Lyft? Uh, Uber and Waymo are both in some sense designing cars. Does that make them direct competitors with an automobile manufacturer? And the point I wanna make is it, it, that may be the wrong way of understanding things. It's, the, the question really is not, are they creating substitute products or services? But the question is, are they competing with each other in ways that should matter to competition law? So once we understand that competition can happen uh, outside of traditional horizontal substitution, what are the implications for competition law? And in the paper uh, I have, on which my shorter paper is based, I offer some thoughts, but very quickly, um, First of all, it's important to understand that the kind of ecosystem competition that I'm talking about uh, may have very important implications for innovations and other aspects of consumer welfare. So it should be of concern to competition policy. And then in which direction does this take us in terms of enforcement or, or antitrust guidance uh, on enforcement decisions? At this point, I'm agnostic, and I, and I simply want to define a phenomenon and invite policymakers and, and, and regulators and, and, and agencies to, to think about the implications of, of, of understanding uh, competition in this way. One could imagine, for example, that a merger that does not involve traditional competitors and therefore would not lead to overlap or even a vertical merger concern necessarily might nonetheless soften competition because those two firms might have been uh, aggressive rivals to shape the value and commodity propositions in their ecosystem. All right, so that might call on some sense for more enforcement. On the other hand, it may be that a market is in fact more competitive already than it appears because once you move past substitutability as the touchstone of competition, you understand that there's actually aggressive competition with benefits to consumer welfare and innovation happening in the market, even though it doesn't cash out as uh, as traditional substitute or horizontal uh, competition. So there are many different implications of, of reimagining how competition uh, works in these uh, often digital uh, ecosystems uh, or, or, sort of, or, or wider technology ecosystems. And my invitation is simply to 
move beyond traditional substitutability in defining what competition means. Thank you. Thank you.